The Evolution of Management Thinking The field of management is undergoing tremendous change. The questionnaire you just completed describes two differing philosophies about how people should be managed. And you will learn more about these ideas in this chapter. Both approaches still apply in today's organization. However, many managers find themselves caught in a situation where the methods and patterns that keep the organization success successful in the past no longer seem right to keep it thriving today into the future. Management philosophies and organizational forms change over time to meet new needs. The workplace of today is different from what it was 50 years ago in the from what it was even 10 years ago, yet some ideas and practices from the past are still highly relevant and applicable to management. Many students wonder why history matters to managers. A historical perspective provides a bro broader way of thinking, a way of searching for patterns and determine whether they recur across time periods. For example, Certain management practices that seem modern, such as open book management or employee stock ownership, have actually been around for a long time. These techniques have repeatedly gained and lost popularity since the early 20th century because of his historical forces. A study of the past contributes to understanding both the present and the future. It is a way of learning from others' mistakes so as not to repeat them, learning from others' success so as to repeat them in the appropriate situation, and most of all, learning to understand why things happen to improve our organization in the future. This chapter provides an overview of the ideas theories, and management philosophies that have contributed to making the workplace what is today. We examined several management approaches that have been popular and successful throughout the 20th century. The final section of the chapter looks at some recent trends and current approaches that build on this foundation of management, understanding, this foundation illustrates that the value of studying management lies not in learning current facts and research, but in developing a perspective that will facilitate the broad, long-term view needed for management success. Management and Organization Studying history doesn't mean merely arranging events in the chronological order. It means developing an understanding of the impact of societal forces on organizations. Studying history is a way to achieve strategic thinking. See the big picture and improve conceptual skills. Let's start by examining how social, political, and economic forces have influenced organizations and the practice of management. Social forces, forces refers to those aspects of a culture that guide and influence relationships among people. What do people value? What do people need? What are their standards of a behavior among people? These forces shape what is known as a social contract, which refers to the unwritten common rules and perceptions about relationships among people and between employees and management. A significant social force today is the changing attitudes, ideas, and values of generations Y employees, sometimes called nexters. These young workers, the most educated generation in the history of the United States, grow up technologically adept and globally conscious. Unlike many workers of the past, they typically are not hesitant to question their superiors and challenge the status quo. 
they want a work environment that is challenging and supportive with access to cutting edge technology opportunities to learn and further their careers and personal goals and a power to make substance substantive decision and changes in the workplace in addition Gen Y workers have prompted a growing focus on work or life balance. Reflected in trends such as telecommunicating, flex time, shared jobs, and organization sponsored sabbaticals. Political forces. Forces refers to the influence of political and legal institutions on people and organizations. Political forces include basic assumptions underlying the political system, such as the desirability of self government, property rights, contract rights, the definition of justice, and the termination of innocence of, or guilt of a crime. The spread of capitalism throughout the world has dramatically altered the business landscape. The dominance of free market system and growing interdependences among the world's countries require organizations to operate differently and managers to think in a new ways. At the same time, strong anti-American sentiments in any parts of the world create challenges for U.S. companies and managers. Economic forces pertains to the avail availability, production, and distribution of resources in a society. Governments, military agencies, churches, schools, and business organizations in every society require resources to achieve their goals. And economic forces influence the alloca allocation of scarce resources. One trend is the growing economic power of less developed countries, the rapid growth of China and India, and their rise in the global marketplace dominated the 2007 World Bank International Monetary Fund annual meetings, for example. Another force is the shifting of the economy of the United States and other developed countries with their sources of wealth, the fundamentals of distribution, and the nature of economic decision making undergoing significant changes. Today's economy is based as much on ideas information management practices and perspectives vary in response to the social, political, and economic forces in their larger society. During difficult times, managers look for ideas to help them cope with environmental turbulence and keep their organizations vital. The managers shop talk list a wide variety of ideas and techniques used by managers. Management idea life cycles have been grow, growing shorter as the pace of change has increased and recent study by professors at the University of Lusania at Lafayette, Lafayette found that from the from the nineteen fifties to the nineteen seventies it typically took more than a decade for interest in a popular management idea to pick. By the 1990s, the interval had shrunk to fewer than three years. Contemporary Management Tools Over the history of management, many fashions and fads have appeared. Critics argue that new techniques may not represent permanent solutions. Others feel the managers adopt new techniques for continuous improvement in a fast-changing world. 
1993, Bain and company started a large research project to interview and survey thousands of corporate executives about the 25 most popular management tools and techniques. The list for 2007 and their usage rates are below. How many tools do you know for me? Of the 20 of the top 25 business process re-engineering re has been mercurial with 69 percent usage in 1995 dropping to 38 percent in 2000 increasing again to 69 percent in 2007 global North American executives are more likely to look outward using strategic alliances and collaborative innovation more than companies in other parts of the world. European executives are big users of customer segmentation. Latin American executives use the fewest number of tools. Asian Pacific executives report higher use of new Newer tools like consumers, integrity, and corporate blogs. Recent challenges such as thought economy and rocky stock in market, environmental and organizational crisis, lingering anxieties over war and terrorism, and the public system and skepticism resulting from co corporate scandals have left today's executives searching for any management tool, new or old that can help them get the most out of limited resources. This search for guidance is reflected in a proliferation, proliferation of books scholar articles and conferences dedicated of to examining management passions and trends illustrate the evolution of significant management perspectives over time each of which will be examined in the remainder of this chapter the timeline reflects the dom dominant time period for each approach but elements of each are still used in today's organizations Classical perspective. The practice of management can be traced to 3000 before Christ to the first government organizations developed by the Sumerians and Egyptians. But a formal study of management is relatively recent. The early study of management as we know it today began with what is now called the classical perspective. The classical perspective on management emerged during the 19th and early 20th century. The factory system that began to appear in the 80s posed challenges that earlier organizations had not encountered. The problems arose in tolling the plans, organizing managerial structure, training employees, many of them non-English speaking immigrants scheduling co complex manufacturing operations and dealing with increased labor dis dissatisfaction and resulting strikes. This my myriad new problems and the development of large, complex organizations demanded a new approach to coordination and control and a new subspi subspices of economic man, the salaried manager, was born. Between 1880 and 1920, the number of professional managers in the United States grew from 161,000 to more than 1 million. These professional managers began developing and testing solutions to the mounting challenges of organizing, coordinating, and controlling large numbers. 
of people and increasing worker productivity. Thus began the evolution of modern management with a classical perspective. This perspective contains three subfields, each with a slightly different emphasis, scientific management, bureaucratic organizations, and administrative principles. Scientific management emphasize scientifically determined jobs and management. Practices as the way improve efficiency and labor productively. In the late 1880s, a young engineer, Frederick Winslow Taylor, in 1856-1915, proposed that workers could be rutled like machines, their physical and mental gears recalibrated for better productivity. Taylor insisted that improving productivity mean that management itself would have to change and further, further that the manner of change could be determined only by scientific study. Hence, the label scientific management emerged. Taylor suggested that decisions based on roles of thumb and tradition be replaced with price Price procedures develop after careful study of individual situations. Taylor's philosophy is encapsulated in his statement, In the past, the man has been first. In the future, the system must be first. The scientific management approach is illustrated by unloading of iron from rail cars and reloading finished steel for the Bitland Steel Plant in 1898. Taylor calculated that with correct movements, tools, and sequencing, each man was capable of loading 47.5 tons per day instead of the typical 12.5 tons. He also worked out an insistive system that paid each man $1.85 a day for, meeting, for meetings. The new standard, an increase from the previous rate of $1.15 productivity at Bethlehem still shoot up overnight. Although known as the father of scientific management, Taylor was not alone in this area. Henry Gant, an associate of Taylor's, developed the Gant chart, a bar graph that measures planned and completed work along each stage of production by time elapsed. Two other important pioneers in this area were the husband and wife team of Frank, Frank B. and Lillian M. Gilbert. Frank B. Gilbert in 19, 1868 to 1924 pioneered time and motion study and arrived at many of his management techniques and independently of Taylor. He stressed efficiency and was known for his for his quest for the one best way to do work. Although Gilbert is known for his early work with bricklayers, his work had great impact on medical surgery by drastically reducing the time patients spent on the operating table. Surgeons were able to save, save countless lives through the application of time and motion study. William M. Gilbert, 18, 1878 to 1972, was more interested in the human aspect of work, where her husband died at the age of 56. She had 12 children, ages 2 to 19. The undaunted first lady of management went right on with her work. She presented
a paper and case of her late husband, continued their seminars and consulting lecture, and eventually became a professor at Purdue University. She pioneered in the field of industrial psychology and made substan substantial contributions to human resources management. Exhibit 2.2 shows the basic ideas of scientific management. To use this approach, managers should develop standard methods for, their, for doing each job, select workers with the appropriate abilities, train workers in the standard methods, support workers, and eliminate interruptions and provide wage incentives. The idea of scientific management that began with Taylor dramatically increased Productiv productivity across all industries, and they are still important today. A recent Harvard Business Review article discussing innovations that shape modern management puts scientific management at the top of its list of 12 influential innovations. Indeed, the ideas of creating a system for maxi maximum efficiency and organizing work for maximum productivity are, de are deeply embedded in our organizations. However, because scientific management ignores the social context and work's needs, it leads to increased conflict and sometimes violent clashes between managers and employees. Under their system, workers often feel exploited a sharp contest from the harmony and cooperation that Taylor and his followers had invention. Bureaucratic organizations, a systematic approach developed in Europe that look at the organization as a whole in the bureaucratic organization's approach. A subfield within the classical perspective, Max Weber, in 1864 to 1920, a German theorist, introduced most of the concepts on bureaucratic organizations. During the late 1880s, Many re European organizations were managed on a personal, family-like basis. Em employees were loyal to a single individual rather than to the organization or its mission. The, dis the dysfunctional consequences of this management practice was the resources were used to realize individual desires rather than organizational goals. Employees, in effect, own the organization and use resources for their own gain rather than to serve customers. Weber envisioned organization that would be managed on a personal, rational basis. This form of organization was called a bureaucracy. Bureaucracy summarizes the six characteristics of bureaucracy as specif specified by Weber. Weber believed that an organization based on rational authority would be more efficient and adaptable. The change because continuity is related to formal structure and positions rather than a particular person who may live or die. To Weber, rationally in organizations meant employee selection and investment base. Not on whom you know, but rather on competence and technical qualifications, which are assessed by examination or according to training and experience. The organization re relies on roles and written records for continuity. In addition, 
rules and procedures are impersonal and applied uniformly to all employees. A clear division of labor arises from distinct definition of authority and responsibility. Legitimized as official duties, positions are organized in a hierarchy, with each position under the authority of a hired one. The manager depends not on his or her personality. For successfully giving orders but on the legal power invested in the managerial position. The term Yurker has taken a negative meaning in today's organization and is associated with endless rules and red tape. We have all been frustrated by waiting in a long lines or following seemingly silly procedures. However, rules and other bureaucratic procedures provide a standard way of dealing with employees. Everyone gets equal treatment and everyone knows what the rules are. This foundation enables many organizations to become extremely efficient. Consider United Parcel Service or UPS sometimes called Big Brown. UPS specialize in the delivery of small packages, delivering more than 13 million every business day. In addition, UPS is gaining market share in air service, logistics, and global information services. Why has UPS been so successful? One important factor is the concept of bureaucracy. UPS is bound up in the, in the rules and regulations. It reaches drivers and astronomy 340 steps for how to correctly deliver a package, such as how to load the truck, how to fasten their seatbelts, how to walk, and how to carry their case. Specific, specific safety rules apply to drivers, loaders, clerks, and managers. Strict dress codes are enforced clean uniforms, cold browns, everyday black or brown polish shoes with non-slip soles, no beards, no hair, no hair, no hair below the collar, and so on. Supervisors conduct three minutes inspections of drivers each day. The company also has rules specifying cleanliness standards for buildings, trucks, and other properties. No eating or drinking is permitted at employee desk. Every manager is given bond copies of policy books and is expected to use them. UPS has a well-defined vision of labor. Each plant consists of specialized drivers, loaders, clerks, washers, sorters, and maintenance personnel. UPS thrives on written records and it has been a leader in using new technology to enhance reliability and efficiency. Drivers use a computerized clipboard to track everything from miles per gallon to data and parcel delivery. All drivers have daily worksheets that specify performance, goals, and work output. Technical qualification is the criterion for hiring and promotion. The UPS policy book says that leader is expected to have the knowledge and capacity to justify the position of leader 
ship. Favoritism is forbidden. The bureaucratic model breaks the spine at UPS, the tightest ship in the shipping business. Administrative principles. Another major subfield within the classical perspective is known as the administrative principles approach. Where, where is scientific management focused on the product productivity of the individual worker. The administrative principles approach focus on the total organization. The contributors to this approach included Henry File, Mary Parker Follett, and Chester I. Barnard. Henry File in 19, 8, 9, 1841 to 1925 was a French mining engineer who worked his way up to become head of a major mining mining group known as Comambolt. Comambolt survives today as a part of Le Creuse Lorry, the largest mining and metallurgical group in central France. In his later years, Philo wrote down his concepts on administration based largely on his own management experiences. In his most significant work, General and Industrial Management, Fyle discussed 14 general principles of management, several of which are part of management philosophy today. For example, unity of command, each subordinate receives orders from one and only one superior. Divisions of work, managerial work, and technical work are amenable to position to produce more and better work with the same amount of effort. Unity of direction. Similar activities in an organization should be grouped together under one manager. Scholar chain. A chain of authority extends from the top to the bottom of the organization and should include every employee. Pyle felt that these principles could be applied in any organizational setting. He also identified five basic functions or elements of management. Planning, organizing, command, commanding, coordinating, and controlling. These functions underlie much of the general approach to, the, to today's management theory. Mary Parker Follett, 1868-1933, was trained in philosophy and political science at what today is Radcliffe College. She applied herself in many fields, including social psychology and management. She wrote of the importance of common super, 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 okay, superdinate goals for reducing conflict in organizations. Her work was popular with business people of her day but was often overlooked by management scholars.
false ideas. Serve as a contrast to scientific management and are emerging as applicable for modern managers dealing with rapid changes in today's global environment. Her approach to leadership stressed the importance of people rather than engineering techniques. She offered that the pithy ad admonition, don't hug, don't hug your blueprints. And analyze the dynamics of management organization interactions. Fault address issues that are timely today, such as ethics, powers, and how to lead in a way that encourages employees to give their best. The concept of empowerment facilitating ra rather than controlling employees and allowing employees to act depending on the authority of the situation open new areas for theoretical study by Chester Barnard and others. Chester I. Barnard in 1886 and 1961 studied economics at Harvard but failed to receive a degree because he lacked a course in laboratory science. He went to work in the statical, statistical department of at and t in 1927 become president of New Jersey Bell. One of Barner's significant contributions was the concept of the informal organization. The informal organization occurs in all formal organizations and includes cliques and naturally occurring social groupings. Barnard argued that organizations are not machines and stressed that informal relationships are powerful forces that can help the organization if properly managed. Another significant, another significant contribution was the acceptance theory of authority, which stated that people have free will and can choose whether to follow management orders. People typically follow orders because they perceive positive benefit to themselves, but they do have a choice. Managers should treat employees properly because their acceptance of authority may be critical to organization success in important situation. The overall classical perspective as an approach to management was very powerful and give companies fundamental new skills for establishing high productivity an effective treatment of employees. Indeed, the United States surged ahead of the world in management techniques, and other con countries, especially Japan, borrowed heavily from American ideas. Human's Perspective Mary Parker Follett and Chester Barnard were early advocates of a more humanistic perspective on management that emphasized the importance of understanding human behaviors, needs, and attitudes in the workplace as well as social interactions and group processes. We will discuss three subfields based on the humanistic, humanistic perspective, the human relations movement, the human resources perspective, and and the behavioral sciences approach. The human relations movement the human, was based on the idea that truly effective control comes from within the individual worker rather than from strict. Authoritarian control this school of thought recognized the directly responded to social pressures for enlightened treatment of employees. The early work on this trail psychology and personal selection received little attention because of the prominence of scientific management. 
then a series of studies at the Chicago Electric Company, which came to be known as the Hawthorne Studies. Change all of that. 